okay so welcome to the 30th video in the discrete structure series we are in the chapter induction and recursion yesterday we had a look at mathematical induction and this video is going to be all about the strong mathematical induction we'll follow a similar approach as we did in the last video we'll have a look at a strong mathematical induction and the core concepts behind it and then we'll dive into some problems all right with that agenda set let's get started by looking into the core concepts behind a strong mathematical induction so at this point we should expect to already be familiar with the idea of mathematical induction and i want to continue on our reasoning of strong induction using the same example of the falling dominoes from yesterday so yesterday our argument in mathematical induction was that we had a pile of dominoes stacked together and then we mentioned that the process of mathematical induction helped us to establish that all dominoes fall and we established that there were two criteria to ensure that all dominoes fell one criteria was that the first domino should be knocked over and then we establish the other criteria as for any arbitrary domino if that domino is knocked over it will also cause the adjacent domino to knock over and then we said that we could use these two arguments to establish that all dominoes fall because we know that the first domino has fallen and any domino will cause the next domino to fall so second will fall third will fall and the chain will continue and so for today's discussion of strong mathematical induction we'll look at a related but slightly different example so I'll put the problem here and our first job will be to verify that the domino problem is going to be equivalent to the problem that I'll put here. So let me show you the problem. So let us imagine that we have a road here and then I have an infinite number of houses built on one side of this road. And we also assume that each of these houses are connected to the road. And just like the domino example, we'll provide two criteria. We'll say that we can go to the first house and then we'll also say that if you are at any house, you can go to the next house. And if we want to prove that we can reach all houses, do you agree that this problem is exactly the same as the domino problem? The reason I chose the house problem is because it makes it easier for me to demonstrate the idea of strong induction. And I can promise you this is going to be a satisfying rebuild. But the prerequisite is that you need to be able to see why this example of dominoes is exactly the same as this example with houses. And you should also be able to see why both of these examples are exactly the process of mathematical induction that we followed in our last video and also solved some problems. So assuming that we are caught up, let me show you a slightly modified version of this house example to see why strong induction is needed. So this time we'll imagine there are two roads. And the arrangement of houses is exactly the same. But in this example, we'll assume that each house is linked to the alternate side of the road. So from this house, you could get to this part of the road. But from here, you could alternate. This is linked to this part of the road. And so it goes like that. Okay, and in this case, the rules are that you can go here and here. And this is interesting. In this case, we are given that if you can reach any house H, you can reach not the next house, but the house next to it. So H plus 2. Because you can see from this diagram, when I'm at house number 1, I can only go to house number 3. There is no way to go from 1 to 2. So similarly from 3 I can only go to 5. And if I look at the even houses from 2 it is only possible to go to 4 and to 6 and so on. So my rule in this case is that from any given house I can only reach the house 2 forward from that house. And what we need to prove is exactly the same. Reach all houses. Now it should be easy to see that it is possible to reach all houses because I can go to house number 1 or 2 whichever I want. So if I need to reach any even numbered house, I'll start by going into house number 2 and then follow this road. And if I need to reach any odd numbered house, I can just start by going into house number 1 and follow this road. So if I were to write a set of rules that you can go to house number 1 and house number 2, and for any given random house, you can go two houses ahead from it, it is possible to reach all houses. I hope you can see that. But does the proof technique of mathematical induction apply here like it did in this example? So the normal mathematical induction way to prove that we can reach all houses requires us to prove that we can go to the first house. We have done that here. And then it also requires us to prove that for any given house, it is possible to reach the next house. And doing these two things will prove reach all houses. So if I apply the same inductive reasoning here, I can go to house number one and house number two. These are my basis steps and this is fine. But my inductive step requires me to assume that you can reach any house K and from that require me to prove that you can reach the next house k plus 1. And in this example, by design, I cannot prove that some house reaches the next house. Because you can see there is no way to get from 1 to 2, or 2 to 3, or 3 to 4. 
so the normal induction technique does not work here i cannot choose a random house and prove that i can go to the house next to it so we are getting really close to strong induction now let me demonstrate one last point and then we'll show exactly what the strong induction process is let me number these houses too so that it's easier so let's review our inductive process i want to start with one and check all the houses that i can reach okay can i reach house number one i definitely can because that is given to me so i can check this off and see how did we prove that we could go to house number two we did that because of this implication it implies that if you can reach any house you can reach the next house therefore if you can reach house number one you can reach house number two but i can reach house number one so house number two simply follows by mode exponents and here is the big takeaway what do i do for three i use exactly the same argument if any implies next then two also implies three but i have already proven it for two but my point and the point of this whole example is that i am forgetting about one when i reach three in order to reach three i only use two facts you can go from two to three and then you can go to two and in this particular case this is enough but i want you to understand that we have already proven for one when we have reached two and the same thing continues when i get to four i am only using the facts that i can reach three and then the fact that three will imply four i am entirely forgetting that i can also reach two and one now forgetting might be a strong word because in this problem i don't need to remember it but the main takeaway is that whenever i was proving for four if i needed i could use not only three but two and one as well so you can see this in the inductive process of the mathematical induction process we assume that pk is true and then prove that pk plus one is true so that is just like assuming four and proving for five but not considering anything before four now let us try to look at this problem but this time we'll try to remember not just the last value but all of the previous houses that we can reach so the question already suggests that i can go to house number one and two so i want to remember them so let me create a set that contains one and two and this suggests that i can reach house number one and house number two this is already proven and see this is given to me if i am at any house i can reach houses two front of it so i need to show that i can reach house number three and fortunately i have not forgotten about one i have remembered that i have previously reached house number one and two so when i need to reach three i do not need to depend on two like i needed to do here I can say that I can reach three from one, so I can prove three that way, and three will also be in my list. And one, two, and three are all of the values that I have proven. And now, when I need to prove it for house number four, will any of my previous proofs help? Definitely, I prove one for two, and it is possible to reach four from two. So I can just use the proof for two to deduce a proof for four, and then I can continue that I can reach all houses. So both of these types of induction are more or less analogous, and the difference only lies in the inductive step. in the inductive step for normal induction i only use k to prove k plus 1 and forget everything before k but in case of strong induction i do not have to forget whenever i am using k in order to prove k plus 1 i am not forced to only use k but i can use all of the previous proofs from 1 to k because the inductive process of reaching k only happens after we have passed all numbers below k it is not just the domino in position number k that has fallen but all dominoes from 1 to k have fallen and i am allowed to use the fact about any of the previously fallen dominoes in order to prove that the next domino falls now this house arrangement is just an example for demonstration but there are real problems in which just the previous step is not enough to derive the next step so we'll be looking into those examples shortly but let's formalize the concept of strong induction now so the basic step is going to be exactly the same proving the given proposition or hypothesis for one or whatever the basic step is and then you would remember for normal mathematical induction we would prove that pk implies pk plus 1 but like we discussed in strong mathematical induction i do not want to forget about all the proofs before pk i can use the proofs for all of the numbers from 1 to k in order to prove k plus 1 and that would look like this so this defines the inductive process for strong induction and see many people get this wrong it does not mean that you have to use everything from 1 to k in order to prove it but it means if you want you can use them and that comes due to the nature of conjunctions so if i have a conjunction a and b and c and d let's say i could use any subset from here and get a valid conjunction so if i were to choose a and c i'll just write a and c and given a and b and c and d is true i can definitely say that a and c is true this is just a simplification from this statement if i want i can say that just c is true so important to understand we are not saying you have to use this but this is available to you but one important note your conjunction must include pk because proving that pk implies pk plus 1 is the bare minimum requirement for induction 
so in your inductive step in order to prove k plus 1 you have to use pk that rule is same as induction but if you need you could use anything less than k up to the base case and for all of the problems that we did in yesterday's video we did not need to use any of the formal proofs just pk was enough to prove pk plus 1 and now how do we know which type of induction to apply we look for a dependency clue we look into the nature of the problem and see if the last step is enough to deduce the next step i think we all know about the fibonacci sequence i have one and one and then every term is the sum of previous two terms and then i have a two three five and it goes like that so in this problem can you find any term by just looking at the previous term no because we need to look at the previous two terms now this is not the problem of induction but I want to give you an idea about the inductive process. If the nature of your problem is such that in order to prove a step just the previous step is enough, you use normal mathematical induction and in cases where just the previous step is not enough, you are allowed to use all the former proofs. And to let you know the process of mathematical induction is equivalent to strong induction. Any proof that can be done using strong induction can also be done using regular mathematical induction but it gets really awkward for some questions. And because of the fact that we are using all former proofs, strong induction is also called complete induction. And when the term complete induction is used, the normal mathematical induction is often called incomplete induction. But this name is really unfortunate as there is nothing incomplete about the process of induction. It's a complete and valid proof technique on its own. So just be aware of this phrase, they might say what is complete induction and you want to refer to strong induction. Okay, I think now we are ready to dive into some problems. Please review these concepts again if you are not sure. But moving on to question number one. Prove that every positive number can be written as a product of primes. The actual solution is quite simple but let's try to logically see why the process of strong induction applies here. And let's remember yesterday's question. n cube minus n is divisible by 3. What did we do in the normal induction process? We assumed that k cube minus k is divisible by 3. So this is my kth step. So k plus 1 whole cube minus k plus 1 is also divisible by 3. And here in order to prove k plus 1, I only needed k. And now let us see what this question is telling us. It is asking us to prove that every positive number can be written as a product of primes. So you should be aware of the prime factorization process. So if I take a positive number like let's say 85, I can factorize it this way. It's going to be 5 times 17. And we can see that 5 and 17 are both prime numbers. So we can say that every number can be expressed as a product of prime numbers. And if we follow the process of normal mathematical induction here, we will start by assuming that k is a product of primes. This is what I can assume. And then I want to prove that k plus 1 is also a product of prime. And listen to this argument. The number k plus 1 can either be prime or composite. Now if k plus 1 is already prime, it is already a product of prime. So I don't need to do anything. But if k plus 1 is composite, then by definition k plus 1 is a factor of at least two numbers. I am not saying that the factors are prime yet, but it is going to be a factor of at least two numbers because it is a composite number. Now see, if I knew that A could be expressed as a product of primes and B could be expressed as a product of primes, my proof would be done. But I don't know that. I only know that K can be expressed as a product of primes. And I know that both of these numbers A and B are less than K because K plus 1 is the product of these two numbers and one of the factors must be at least 2 because if any of A or B is 1, then it is just a prime number. It's not a composite number. So I can guarantee that both A and B are going to be less than K plus 1. But if I were allowed to use a strong mathematical induction, I do not need to assume that only k is a product of primes. I am allowed to assume that everything from 1 to k is a product of primes. And now that makes it easier for me. Since both a and b are less than k plus 1, they will definitely be in this range of 1 to k plus 1. So my assumption will include both a and b. Okay, so let's do it a little bit properly here. So we'll prove our inductive basis step. And this actually says every positive number greater than 1. Obviously 1 cannot be expressed as a product of primes. Alright, therefore my basis is going to look like P2 which is 2 can be expressed as a product of primes which is a true statement. 2 is just 2, it's already prime. A product of primes does not necessarily mean two numbers need to be multiplied. 2 is already a product of primes. So my basis case is established. So next let me build my inductive premise. So in normal induction, our inductive premise would just be the fact that PK is true. But here like we looked at a while ago, it's going to be P1 to PK. And what does it mean to assume this? What is this really saying? 1 is a product of prime and 2 is a product of prime and 3 is a product of prime and up to k everything is a product of prime. So this is the same as saying all numbers from 1 to k are product of primes. And now we can do our actual induction and the requirement in the induction is exactly the same as normal induction. I need to prove that pk plus 1 is true. And that is the same as asking 
prove that k plus 1 is a product of primes. Now before we follow up writing this, we need a little bit of language that I'm gonna skip here. But we need to mention our discussion from earlier. k plus 1 can either be prime or composite. If it is prime, it is already a product of primes. But if it is composite, the number k plus 1 can be written as the product of two factors a and b. And I can be able to guarantee that both a and b are gonna be at least 2 but it's strictly less than k plus 1. Because if I'm writing something like 20 is equals to something times something and one of them is at least 2, this is guaranteed to be less than 20. So that is what I'm doing here. And the reason we wanna do this is now we know that both a and b fall on the range of 1 to k. So you'll follow up with a little bit more language. From the inductive premise, we know both a and b can be written as a product of primes. Therefore, the number k1 can ultimately be written as a product of primes. And I know this process looks almost like cheating, but it works beautifully. Let me demonstrate you with an example of this reasoning process. So I start with my basis. 2 can be expressed as a product of primes. So my set will have 2. This is already established. And for a number like 3, my argument was to ask the question if 3 was already prime. In this case, 3 is already prime. So I prove on for 3. And let's say we get to 4. And in 4, 4 is a composite number. So we enter this reasoning. We express 4 as 2 times 2. But whatever these numbers in the product are that are making 4, these are definitely less than 4. And for all of the numbers less than 4, I've already proven that they can be expressed as a product of primes. So 4 can also be expressed as a product of primes. And the idea is later when I get to 8, I am remembering 4. So when I follow the same logic and say that 8 is going to be 2 times 4, I would have already proven 2 and I would have already proven 4. And repeating the same thing for the last time, if this was normal mathematical induction, you only know that 7 can be replaced as a product of primes. And that is not helpful in proving that 8 can be written as a product of primes. Alright, so we'll be looking into one more problem. Any number greater than or equal to 12 can be constructed using only the numbers 4 and 5. So let us see what this question means. If I have 12, I can write that is 4 times 3. And this 3 only means that I had to use 4 3 times. But what I had to use actually was just 4s. You could think about it this way. If you had a 2 liter vessel, you could fill it entirely using 4 liter vessels. And you need to fill it 3 times. But a 3 is not important, 4 is. The question is asking any number greater than 12 can be constructed just using 4 and 5. So how would you construct 13? I would take 2 of 4 and then a 1, 5. Okay, so I'm taking 2 from the 4 liter gallon and 1 from the 5 liter gallon and that gives me 13 gallons. So I need to prove that for any number greater than 12, let it be let's say 27, I can recreate that number just using 4 and 5. It's going to be a linear combination of 4 and 5. Alright, our basic step this time will start at P12 because any number greater than or equal to 12. So numbers less than 12 are not here. And I need to verify that P12 is true. That 12 can be constructed just using 4 and 5. So I can write that 12 is just 4 times 3 like we saw there. So which means this is true. Okay, the number 12 can be represented just by using 4s and 5s. I did not have to use 5 but I am not forced to. The requirement is don't use anything except 4 and 5. And this problem is possible to do with normal mathematical induction as well. So let me demonstrate that first. So we'll assume that PK is true. So assuming that any K is true means that this K can be expressed just using 4 and 5. Okay. So we'll assume that some A1 times 4 plus some A2 times 5 is making up this number K. And we want to prove that PK plus 1 is also true. So that K plus 1 is also be possible to made just using 4 and 5. So how can we show that? Let me show you how. So we need to assume that this is true and we need to show that some numbers exist that we can put here and that will represent k plus 1 using just 4s and 5s. So we'll start using our assumption that this is true. That means this number k could be written just using 4s and 5s. And in this, I want to be able to see two cases. 4 used, 4 not used. Because you see, when we formed 12, it was 4 times 3. It was just 4s. If we need to form some number like 15, it's just going to be 5 into 3. So sometimes 4 may be used, sometimes 5 may be used, sometimes both may be used. There are multiple cases, but I'm only interested in these two cases. The case where 4 is used and the case where 4 is not used. So you should agree that these two cover all cases. Either 4 is going to be used or 4 is not going to be used. Now let's come to this case first. We are assuming that 4 is used, okay? In order to make k, some 4 were used. Then I can just change one of those fours that was used into a five. And that would increase the sum by one. I'm not changing all fours by fives, but changing only one of those fours into a five. 
so the sum will remain exactly the same but because one four was changed into a five the new sum will be k plus one so let's say we have this number three into four plus two into five so this is ten plus twelve is equal to twenty two so twenty two would be expressed this way in our game and our logic here is that in order to reach twenty three we see if there is a four and we need to change one four to a five so what does that give us we only have two fours left and then we have three fives and you can see this is equal to 23 so this is the logic that we are showing here in this case okay now we'll go into the second case that says that four was not used at all okay so there is no part that says four and the number is created only using fives because if there are just one four my problem would be solved this way but there are no fours at all so i'm looking at fives now and i want you to verify that there should be at least three fives because my number is greater than 12 and this is a number that is created only using fives so 15 can be the smallest number like that and 15 is equals to 3 times 5 so i can say that at least 3 fives are present here okay so greater than or equal to 3 a2 is going to be greater than or equal to 3 okay so assuming i have at least 3 here's what i'm going to do i have my sum of k i'm going to take 3 fives and change that into a 4 if i have 8 fives for example 8 into 5 I'm just going to leave 5 into 5 just like that. I'm not going to change that, but I'm going to take the 3 that I need. And for all of the 3 5s that I take, I'm going to change them into a 4. So what would that do to the sum? I just changed 3 5s into a 4. So that would reduce the sum by 3. And now I want to add 1 4. And then I'm going to add 1 4. And then this is going to be k plus 1. So let's say a number like 35 is expressed as 7 times 5. 5 times 7. So it is expressed using only fives. There is no four used in this case. And our argument is that we'll take three fives and leave the others the same. So let me take three into five and leave four others the same. Now for the three fives that I have taken, I want to convert all of them into a four. So this is just going to be three of those fours plus four into five. And this is just like doing k minus three. You see this sum is 35 and this is 32. And our idea was once we reach this step, we want to add one four. So if I add the four now, I get a 36. So from 35, I'm able to jump to 36. So using the process of induction, we are able to demonstrate that if we can make k sense using only four and five, we can also make k plus one using four and five. All right. So this same problem can also be done using strong induction. So if the question asks you specifically to use a strong induction, let me also show you the approach for that. Alright, now in case of strong induction, I need to build multiple hypotheses. I'll explain the reason for that shortly, but let me write that down first. So I have P12. I need to be able to show that 12 can be expressed as a sum of 4 and 5. It's 4 times 3. But for strong induction, I want a few more cases. Now in strong induction, we take an arbitrary k and assume that everything less than k is also true. So P12, because 12 is my least number, and P13 all the way up to pk this should imply pk plus 1 so we can assume that every number from 12 to k can be expressed as a combination of 4 and 5 and use that to prove for k plus 1 and here the argument is quite simple we know that pk is true but not just this we also know that pk minus 3 is true i'll tell you why k minus 3 but we know that this is true because this is one of the values less than k and that means if I'm at a number k like let's say 23 and I want to prove that 23 can be written as a combination of 4 and 5. What I'm saying here is 23 minus 3. 20 can be written as combination of 4 and 5. And this comes from my assumption because my number 20 is less than k. That is 23. And once I know about 20, I can just add a 4 in order to get 24. So that is the basic idea. In order to create some number like let's say 35, take 3 numbers below. It's going to be 32. And whatever arrangement that you use for 32, just add one more 4 and that's going to get you to 36. And do you see why the strong mathematical induction applied here? In order to prove 36, I did not have to rely on 35. Previously, we took the combination of 35 and then we argued, remove 4 this way and add 5 this way and then you can get to 36. But that argument was complicated. But when I am at 35, if I am allowed to use 32, my argument becomes simpler. I can simply add 4 and reach 36. And that is the reason I have three premises here because I want to ensure that on subtracting three, the value that I get is still falls on one of my base cases. I cannot prove for 13 using nine because nine does not exist. So we established 12, 13, 14 in the base case 
and now the list you could choose is 15 and when I subtract 3 it is 12. I already have a representation for 12 and our argument simply says find whatever that arrangement is and add one more 4. So how do you do this formally? You say your basis step is going to include all of these steps and then you assume that every number from 12 to k follows the property and you will argue that k minus 3 being in the range of 12 also follows the same property that is k minus 3 has already been written as a combination of 4 and 5 and we just need to take that already written combination and add 1 4 and when we add 1 4 on k minus 3 we just get to k plus 1 that is the next number that I needed to prove for alright so that is the formal discussion for this video so there is one example that is given in your textbook I am not sure if this is something that could be asked in an exam but we will have a quick look anyway so this game contains two pile of matches and the idea is there is the same number of matches in both of these piles so let's say if there are 50 matches here there are also 50 matches here and this is a game played by two players A and B and the game rules are pretty simple at any given time a player will be in turn and whosever turn it is they can remove any number of matches from any pile and once player A does that player B does the same and then it's A's turn again and then B and then A and then the turn continues and the question in the strong induction is prove that player B always wins the game so player B is the player who plays second okay that player will always win the game and the first player to play this game must always lose so we start by the base case in the base case there will still be two piles but there will only be one match the question says that there are going to be an equal number of matches in both tiles and we need to prove that no matter what the number of matches is player B always wins the game so we want to start with the base case assuming there are only two matches and see now it is A's turn now A only has two choices here you can choose to remove the one and only match from here or from here and if I have not mentioned this the player to remove the last match is the winner so when A comes in first he cannot remove this and this match at the same time because they are in different piles so the best he can do is either remove this in which case B will remove this and win the game and if A chooses to remove this B will just remove this and win the game so in case of one matches B will always win now let us demonstrate by assuming two matches one more base case and A needs to go first it's easy to see the winning strategy for B it is quite simple whatever matches A removes B will remove the same number of matches from the opposite pile from the other pile so let's say I have 2 and 2 here A chooses to remove both of them I'll remove both of them and win but if A chooses only one I will also choose only one and wait and then there is again the one and one game which I can already win we have proven it previously and now you can see the same thing if it is 50 and 50 it doesn't even matter so let's say A comes first and takes 25 out of this B is going to do exactly the same he's going to take 25 of the opposite pile so he can guarantee that he will always remain equal to A but as every round progresses the number of matches will go down and down eventually B will be able to force A to the version of the game that had only one matches and we know that B can win the game so what is our inductive argument here so we say that if the game only has one matches B can win and we explain why now we can assume that for any game from 1 to k matches see we are using a strong induction here for any game that involves 1 up to k matches b can win and now i need to use this fact in order to prove that k plus 1 is also the same so how can we show that b will win for k plus 1 matches given the fact that he can win for any number of matches from 1 to k so we can follow a similar argument when a goes first he is forced to remove at least one match from at least one pile and as B will do exactly the same will remove the same number of matches from another pile now after one round at least one match has been removed so whatever the number of remaining matches is it is within the range of 1 to K and that falls within my inductive premise I have assumed that it is true for 1 to K and hence the proof follows for K plus 1 alright so that concludes the discussion for this video in the next video we'll be looking into the third topic of induction and that is the well ordering property and we'll also come to know that mathematical induction, the strong induction and well ordering property are essentially equivalent. So in the next video, we'll be finishing induction and we'll be ready to move on to recursion. And I really want to take some time to thank all of you guys for recent support and comments. I will 100% use your feedback to improve my videos. So if you have any feedback, do not hesitate to post them to me. Thank you so much for watching. See you guys in the next video and bye.